Hey, welcome back to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast. We're sitting here with Chris Pappas, the writer, director, executive producer, producer, consultant. I don't know what the hell all your titles are, but he's but Chris has done wrote The Wrong Missy on Netflix, number one movie during COVID. If you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. It's so hilarious with David Spade. Lauren Lapkus. No, I, 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 I just don't know that name as well. I'm sorry, you Lauren. You will know her. A Lauren, I, now, Lauren be, I want you on the... bowing to her. I want you on the shrimp tank because uh, you really were phenomenal. And Spade, you were phenomenal. Um, the do-over, Adam Sandler, The Righteous Gemstones. This gentleman is one of the reasons why that show is one of HBO's top shows. Yeah, it's it is. It's, you, it's all because it's of you. It's a team effort. It's a team effort. Uh, with Danny McBride and John Goodman and Daniel Schwartzman, is that right? Is that J- right? Jason, Jason Schwartzman. Well, Jason's this year. Yeah, Adam a- De- Adam Devine. Adam Devine, which yeah. is hilarious. Edie Patterson, who's amazing, is the sister. And and you got Eric Roberts now on the show. Eric Roberts, yeah, uh, he's finally making a name for himself over Julia. Yeah, uh, he's made some interest. He was in that movie with uh, Sharon Stone and um, Sly Stallone. I'm sure he was. <laughs> the specialist or something? I don't know. He was a bad dude. But um, So we were talking with Chris. And by the way, I'm Eric Elkins, the host of the Shrimp Tank Podcast, Charleston Show. And we were talking, before we went to break, we were talking about the world of working with Oliver Stone mm-hmm. and how that kind of started, propelled your career. And I'm just curious because he's such a badass, Oliver Stone, cold just seems like a ruthless and his movies are phenomenal it, did you start to get and see the world in hollywood starting then like what hollywood's really like and how cold and ruthless it really could well, be yeah i mean oliver like you know he was just an intimidating guy he was you know he had a big heart he was good to his people and um uh you know it was it was it was i was lucky to 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 be there and be able to kind of like a month out to Los Angeles and see the landscape of like, like, you know, if I'm going to be a writer, if I'm going to be a director, what's my path, you know? And it's a cold, you know, it is a cold um, profession, you know, like people say like your son or your daughter, like I do not want them to be writers, (laughs) like what you have to go through. Like I'll give you an example of um, a friend of mine from film school. So I'm living in L.A. I'm working for Oliver Stone. And um, I'm probably two years into living out there. And um, a guy behind me in the film class uh, who is very talented. And he really took to our, our um, screenwriting professor at RIT in Rochester Institute of Technology. And he had gone out on his own. Again, taking a leap of faith, which always is kind of paramount when you're talking about you know, doing this shit on your own. And he had this book, and it was a book from the 80s. It was written, and it had been optioned by, I think, TriStar Studios and renewed like... Oh, TriStar was the horse that went like yeah, this? Yeah, exactly. The horse with the wings. Yeah. Um, and anyway, he, he loved this book. He's like, this book is a movie. And this is him as like a, you know, just like one year out of um, film school. So he's a young dude, like, and just to have the foresight to this. And... He wrote a script based off of it, even though it was owned by TriStar Studios. But they had, um, and he wrote the author, okay? Because this story actually comes full circle to Charleston in a minute. Um, And he wrote the author and said, listen, I have a great idea about turning your book into a movie. And this author's not really a faint, this this. I'll Just, drop. Oh yeah, I'll bring that back. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not giving you the name of the book okay. or the author yet because I will dovetail it oh back into the story. Is this is this a is, is this an exclusive we're getting? This right is now? a this is a this is a good Hollywood story. This is like one of those moments. This is like this is the shit that you put into a book and you know like and you give it to like young people to kind of chew on if you're going to try to go make it in LA because this is how cold it can be and how great it can be. So he takes the initiative, writes this. This um this screenplay, I'm the only fucking person that he can call. Okay, like that's his Rolodex. He calls me, and I'm just like new to LA. I mean, granted, I'm working for Oliver, and but still, I'm just a 
you know, I'm a nothing out there. And he goes, listen, I wrote the author. TriStar, his option is up in next month. And he has given me six months because he liked the way I took the book, which was, I think the book was a, not a two-hander, which means there was one main character and they referred to this other character but didn't really go into it in the book. And he flushed that character out and made the movie about these two guys. And, uh, and so he's like, he had everything. He flew out to L.A., he met with me, and he goes, read the book. Here's the contract. I have all the stuff, um, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. You know, when you're out in LA, when you're a writer, you get a lot of this stuff where I have to like spend nine hours like going over my friends or my, you know, ultimately now it's like my, you know, my parents' friends' nephew that you have to read their stuff. And you, but you have to commit. You have to do it. And you have to put in the time. It's like, but it is exhausting. And usually this stuff never works out. Yeah. And um, I read the script. I read the book, and I'm like, "Damn, this is pretty good. Like, this, is, uh, I could see this being a really good movie." I'm like, "Well, he's like, what do you think about Oliver Stone?" I'm like, "I go, oh," and he said, "But I need a, an attorney first. Do you know any entertainment attorneys? Because I don't have an attorney to just make sure all this stuff I'm protected." And I'm like, "I actually know a pretty good attorney. Like, a, one of my good friends um, ha- was really good friends with a, a top a, a entertainment attorney, and so I hooked them up." That entertainment attorney looked at the book and he goes, you know what? Spielberg last year read all, there was six different versions of this book that had been written by six different screenwriters. You're talking about like, I don't know, six to $10 million spent in development just to try to like turn this book into a movie. And Spielberg didn't like any of them and then moved on. And uh, so it had been a year. He said, let me, I'll give it to his people. And know that there's a new script. Maybe they'll see something in it. Next thing you know, they call him up and say, we want to buy your script. Spielberg liked it. He loved the two-hander really? aspect of it. And all of a sudden, Ed, like, and all of a sudden, I get a call from Ed, and he's like, he's like, guess what? He's like, Spielberg wants to do my movie. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit. It's like true. It's like, I remember he was like, yeah. It was like, now there's internet now. And, uh, and I go online and like... Uh, you know, this is like a year later or something, and uh, it says like pre-production, and they bought the script, and he didn't make that much money. When you sell your first script, you make like there's like a guild minimum, and you get like ten percent over, unless you can hold it hostage for some reason, which he could have in this case, but he didn't. And so, like, what would he? When did he this probably happen? made eighty grand. Or okay. He made sixty to eighty. Well, it was probably like eighty grand. And uh, but there's his name, boom, Ed Walsh, written by. And uh, but then there's uh, but Spielberg didn't even meet with him. He which is n- kind of normal. Ed's a nobody. He's just this you know twenty mid. He was probably twenty six at the time, and uh, you know and he doesn't meet with Spielberg. Spielberg hires Jeff. I think it was Jeff Nathanson who's like an A list guy who he's gone to, you know, many times before Spielberg, and he does his whole pass on it. It's in production. It's shooting, and. Uh, and to make a long story short, it uh, the movie is Catch Me If You Can. Uh, no shit. With DiCaprio. And, and um, Frank Abagnale lives here. Frank Abagnale, there you go, is in Daniel Allen, I think. And uh, Yeah. And um, and so d- if Frank's listening to this, you got to get in touch with me because like, we got to reach out to Ed because Ed went sideways, I think, after this whole thing because this is what happened. It gets to um, a guild arbitration. So Jeff Nathanson challenges screenplay credit because he gets paid twice as much if that movie gets made. And Ed, you know, but he's armed to the hills with like, you know, his attorneys. He knows how to do this. Ed, like, you have to trust that the Writers Guild is going to protect you. But the problem is he didn't create the characters. All the characters were in the book. If he had created the original screenplay, yeah, it's a, it's then a he would have, like, he, he would definitely had like shared credit. He didn't have any credit. They completely cut him out of it. So that his name's not even. He's like the caterer has a name on the movie, <laughs> and Ed brought that movie back to the dead. He gave us that movie. Damn it! And he got screwed. And so that's a cold Hollywood tale for you. Yeah, that movie, which is it's always on TV. It's it's amazing. Catch yeah. me if you can. And you're right. Spielberg did uh, produced it. 
um, he didn't, did he direct it too? Did, I don't remember if he Spielberg directed, directed it. He yeah. did. Yeah. And, um, but the Tom Hanks character, he, he was the one, that book is not about Tom Hanks. That was Ed's vision. So how does he not get his name on the movie? Why isn't Tom Hanks backing up Ed, uh, Ed Walsh on this? I mean, Tom, a, nobody Ed, knows. I mean, the, Tom it, doesn't it, have this role, but nobody knows this story. And but Walsh we do isn't now. Nobody. Now we do now, but we should go back and change it. You're right. Oh my God. So yeah. where, where's Ed now? Oh God, I don't. Where know. are you, Ed? Where are you? Ed was a bit of a boozer, unfortunately. He was. Yeah. You think? He's... I love Ed. I hope. Like I've tried to like research and you know. Have you run into him. Frank Abagnale when you've been here? I haven't. But what? like, if I run into Spielberg or Frank Abagnale, I'm telling them the story. I'm sure Spielberg won't like to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's a good idea for you, man. I mean, your career is on fire. And I think he'd feel bad. He probably never heard. Like, he probably doesn't know. He doesn't like that. Didn't his eye was on making the movie? You know, you're not eyes on Ed Walsh. Like, he didn't like. It goes through so many. And you back think channels. you think Frank knows the story? Well, he should because um, Ed, you know, reached out to him and got his he specifically, and and Frank enabled Ed to kind of take the movie. And I'm, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know if Frank stood up for him or he even had it, like, you know, could or was out of his hands. That would be a question I would ask Frank. Yeah. Guys, you're listening to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast. We're sitting here with Chris Pappas. I'm Eric Elkins, owner of Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions. But I have this side gig where I get to talk to guys like this and get to hear the the ruthless, cold life (laughs) of Hollywood and that is a great. That's a great story, man. I mean, yeah. No, it's a. It's, it's a sad story. Though. It's a sad story. That's a. You know, I tell people that story, and they're like all excited to like hear about it, catch me if you can. And then I'm like, he got no credit, and he was an alcoholic and never wrote <laughs> again. And everyone's like, uh oh shit, I shouldn't want to be a writer, should I? <laughs> well, why don't you just? Um, why don't Why don't you just basically? Um, you could you could write the Ed Walsh story now. Where is Ed now? Where is Ed now? You turn it into Ed, a comedy. Where are you? <laughs> yes, you're Ed. talented. Yes, he was very talented. He was really. I mean, that guy was like. I mean, think about what he did. Entrepreneurial guy, right? Right? Like that's a that's a that's a freaking good move. Like he contacts the author. He like all that shit he had to navigate through to get that movie made, and it. Not only does it get made, it gets made does, with does DiCaprio he, and Tom Hanks and right. Spielberg. Like, does, are does, you kidding me? Does he um does he talk to Frank Abagnale? I, you know what? That's a, that again. That's a Ed, that's a Frank Abagnale question. So you don't know if Ed ever even spoke to Frank. I lost track of Ed. You know, damn it. Where uh, is Ed? Where is Ed? <laughs> the search for Ed. <laughs> yeah, get him credit, guys. We we have so much more to go into, but that is an excellent story. One of the best stories ever told on the shrimp tank. You heard it live, not live, but live for whoever is watching it now. Chris Papp has just told us really the real story behind Catch Me If You Can and the ruthless world of Hollywood. Enough about Ed. Let's talk about let's talk about you. And I'm gonna turn I'm gonna turn my chair now because I gotta I gotta move now because I gotta get comfortable. All right. So, you, when you migrate away from Oliver Stone, where what happens? What, what, you well, know, that's a great question because um, I keep telling you I only ask phenomenal questions. But go ahead. <laughs> that's a you know that's a loaded question. That's actually the the biggest. Um, that was the biggest monster ball that I was like had that, that fork in the road. So when I'm working there, I figured out pretty quickly. Um, there, there's two roads to take and it is pretty sexy. It's pretty cool working. You're out there. I'm twenties. I'm in the know working for Oliver. You know, you got weight behind you. You got like, I call home and I'm like, I'm working for Oliver. Stone. <laughs> I'm standing, I'm holding his Oscar right now. You know, I just went and got him yeah. coffee. And, uh, exactly. I put, I I put just, creamer. In there's it. one time I got, um, Warren Beatty French fries. <laughs> And I had to run in the rain to go get his French did fries. Did you really? Yeah, they, they forgot his French fries. Did you? And I'm get, like, I'll go get him. Did you <laughs> hand it to Warren? I did. Did he go? Hey, thank you. Yes. And they came back, and like the assistant was like, "Okay, thank you." I'm like, "No, nah, I'm handing these to Warren." <laughs> and you did. And you, I did. You took and the I realized, initiative. but I also realized that like you really don't get anything from that. 
You know, you're kind of like it's like uh, you know. Is he is he was is he a nice guy? He's a nice guy. I mean, I didn't really hang out with the dude. I handed him French fries, but um, you know, but you because he just seems kind of like he'd be kind of a guy you'd be disappointed in. The the coolest thing, just a quick thing about one of my best moments working for him was um, they were they were doing um, the football movie uh, with Al Pacino Mm -hmm. and Jamie Foxx. Yeah, that's any another, given Sunday. Oh, dude, that's a great story. But I won't go into that. Uh, no, I, no let's that's hear a it. long story. Just give. Can you tell a story in less than two minutes? Can I you do I, an elevator pitch? Well, one thing, uh, the, real quickly, the best was listening. To, I'm like ten feet away from Al Pacino, rehearsing, and uh, for that movie, because you're working for him was, at that time. Yes, exactly. So any given Sunday. They were in pre-production when I was there. I started there when they were. Um, they just wrapped Natural Born Killers. I was there for Nixon. Yeah, I was actually a face Great in the movie. crowd. I was an extra in that. Um, they just threw everybody in the movie uh, in this one scene. Um, and do you then, watch, do you do you watch that with Charlie every every weekend? Yeah. You put that on. He has no idea. <laughs> um, Hold on, let's rewind. Nixon's a tough one to go back to and watch again. Yeah. You know, it's like that's it a was commitment. so good, but it's hard it to is. go back to watch a lot of his movies because they're just so long and. Yes, no, they're just right. It's kind of like there. There's a lot to it, but that's not how I feel about the wrong Missy. Wrong Missy, you can watch a hundred times. Yes, I wish I smoked weed because <laughs> that show, that movie would be phenomenal if you smoked weed. Yeah. Oh, so the quick story though about well, smoking yes. weed said way back to Oliver Stone, <laughs> but um, he uh, um, that so the other caveat about that is Puffy P Diddy. Yeah. So at the time he was P Diddy, and he was set to be the quarterback in the Jamie Foxx thing. And true story, he came in and he read. He was actually a pretty good actor. And we we're like, wow, all right. He, like I saw, we, he was there with um, with Pacino, reading lines. I'm like, dude, this is so cool. And then they set to do a. He had never played football, even though it's like I think his son played college football, um, like later, like you know, like recently, but way back in the this would be the late '90s. Um, they took him out to the practice field, and it was like. He was going out with Y.A. Tittle, which is a famous uh, Hall of Fame quarterback. And Y.A. Tittle was teaching him, you know, formations and throw the football because I guess he never really played football. And so they were like, they went out with, I think, the line of like the Santa Monica like high school team and like P. Diddy and Y.A. Tittle. And they videotaped it. To, and then Oliver was going to look at it and, you know, like to see like, you know, just to make sure they want to make it look real. And... uh and I guess, like, I come into the office on Monday, and one of the guys there is like, dude, you got to see this video. And, uh, <laughs> and I, like, watch the video, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, he, like they couldn't make him. He's they, the worst athlete. No, he couldn't throw. It looked like, it'd be like, if uh, you're, are you right or left-handed? Um, I'm both. Oh, you're actually. both. Okay. Kristen, are you right or left-handed? I'm left-handed. So how good can you throw right-handed? Uh, actually, a lot. <laughs> All right, well, this is about how good P. Diddy could throw, apparently. It was so funny. I, I could imitate the throwing motion right now, but every attempt, it was like, right, why a tittle scratching his head? <laughs> like and I then, like, let's try it again, and it would be like, oh, that's even worse. <laughs> like, And uh, it was so humbling. It must have been so humbling for, for P. Diddy. And so Oliver comes back, and he's like, all right, that dude's he's out. We can't do it. And uh, next thing you know, it's like the, the receptionist is like, P. Diddy is downstairs, <laughs> and he's not happy. Because <laughs> he's on, his, turned, career, his career is on fire oh, then. So uh, no one turns P. Diddy down no, back then. This would be a story, like, I might have P. Diddy after me for telling the story, <laughs> because, like, this was, this, like, he was, like, he won. And we had this, like, new receptionist at the front. You just hire Suge Knight. You'll be and fine. I, I remember, like, people went back to Oliver, and they're like, P. Diddy's downstairs. Like, what does he want? They're like, he wants to fuck you up, Oliver. <laughs> and it was like, oh, shit. And it's this, like, 22-year-old guy from, like, Minnesota who's, like, the nicest guy in the world. And Oliver comes out, and he's just, like, standing over this guy. And he's like, he's like, what did P. Diddy say? And he's like, um, um. And he's like, you pick up that t- phone, and you tell P. Diddy to go fuck himself. <laughs> and, and, and we had to wheel the kid away. He was so... Traumatized from all of it, like, like you know, like he's gonna tell P Diddy to go fuck himself, and like Oliver's like, <laughs> s- 
screaming at him like like i think we had to send him to the you, hospital you, you're watching this i'm whole like thing. oh my god this is amazing like yeah and uh, they called his agent they diffused it and then two days later it was announced that p diddy had a scheduling conflict <laughs> <laughs> he cannot do the movie and i'm uh, like i said to the other guy in the office um i'm like i need that tape i want that tape of him throwing Oh, that tote is gold. Oh my god! And then like he's like, no, and he like hid it from me because he knew I was gonna take the tape and like show it to everybody. Uh, talk about talk about really coming out <laughs> and you, you're you're throwing some stuff I never imagined. I mean, catch me if you can. Ed Walsh is really the man behind that movie. No credit. Um, he at least he, should have got an executive pro- or I, a producer credit. Like he should be on the movie. Like, I whether agree. Or not, like but, I can't tell you how much was rewritten. I mean, the fact that he kind of like, like he got the flushed out the Tom Hanks character should be a reason enough to give I, him. I'm credit. with you, but then yeah. you, now you throw the 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 hammer, the sledgehammer <laughs> on P Diddy was let go because he has no throwing ability. This is what happens when you're in your 20s and you go out to California and you just you know try to get in the business. But oh, so go back to the story. Okay, so the the matzo ball we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay, so in order for me. To have a career, I had two choices. One, I could stay and be someone's assistant and then be a development executive. And that was a pretty easy path because I'm personal. I am I know what I'm doing. I love film. And a lot of smart people, That's that's you want to get in the business and you want to have a job, that's what you do. And what, and what do you do in that job? Like, so, like, like for example, it's the people who I'm like working for. So if I'm, like, you know, writing, like, like something for Fox right now, I'm working with an executive there, a VP, executive, president of production. And a lot of them are their development executives. So they're in charge of the material. They give notes, they give, you know, feedback. And, and you hope that they're, 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 they have creative bones in them. A lot of them don't, but some of them do. And I remember thinking, I could be a pretty good, ex- I know I'd be a pretty good executive. Like, and it, and, and it pays. Like you get. Yeah, like, like what, 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 it, w- when you've done it for ten years, what it would hypothetically, what do you, would you be making? Hypothetically? Well, it depends. Like if you rose, and if you're like the president, well, not of that a company, but that's the that's the path, man. Like like you be a VP, and you can like you're making movies. I mean, that's the thing is like you're making the movies, you know. Like, and if you like, I remember New Line Cinema, like that was a boys' club, you know. They were making movies, and it was like if you work for there for them. You know, uh, it'd be like, hey, I got an idea for a movie. Let's do this. Like, cool. Let's call Vince Vaughn, offer him $10 million to do it. You know, um, it gets done. It's like kind of like there is a definitely like there was an attraction. I saw that road very clearly. And I saw myself at the time being in my mid 30s tied to like, you know, a car lease and, and, <laughs> and like a too expensive, you know, condo. And I couldn't quit. And I thought to myself, I'm, I want to like, kill myself because i want to like get out i want to be creative i want to write and so i said to myself well why do that to yourself like then why don't you just like do why don't you be a writer now but the problem is to do that you kind of have to go get a job that's not in the business very few people can work in the business where you're getting a paycheck for not being a writer to be a writer it almost doesn't happen there's very few people that can do that and uh, and they just lucky. They're they're outliers. They're just like it. Just you know, but you that is a very hard thing to do because you're pigeonholed. If you're an executive, like it is so hard to flip that up. Even if you're a great writer, it's just a hard thing to do, um, and almost impossible. Very few. You could maybe count them on one hand that have been successful transitioning from a successful successful executive to a successful. Director and, or creative, and so and and you're the you have that artist photography type blood, yeah. That you always really were more leaning to to the writing side, the artistic side. I, you know, there's two ways to direct. I remember being like, okay, I can write or I can max out my credit cards and, and make a movie. And um, I chose just you know I just was like you know what, I love writing, and that's really it starts with everything. You know, Oliver Stone was a writer, and then he gets a chance to direct. Um, and I just needed to get really good at it. Like, you know, I was like, I wasn't a great writer, you know, but then I was like, when I went to LA and I kind of had that, like that fork in the road in front of me and I made the creative choice. Now it was like, if I'm going to write, 
I need to like really make sure I know what I'm doing. And I remember like getting like the shrunken white, whatever, the grammar books, everything. I brush up everything. I was like reading. I mean, I was already reading a million scripts. And, but and when you're because I'm a, I'm oblivious. I mean, we <clears throat> we had uh, Josh Lieb on the show, another writer. Um, and I, I, I didn't really go into it with him, so I'm going to ask you. When you sit and write, are you writing, like when I write something to prep for a show, I, I'm writing and, and it doesn't say, I say this and Chris says that. It just says, um, basically, you know, it's a paragraph. When you're writing, you do you have to go by character? He, uh, The character is saying this? Or when you first start, are you just writing the story? Um. You know, it's it, it just it, I look at it like there's a blank canvas and then there's the idea. Okay. So it's like it's like kind of like everything's like out there. It's really just what's the movie? What's the third act? It's very mechanical, actually. It becomes that way. It's like I know the process. It's almost like building a house. Like, right, like if I looked at a house, I'm like, how the fuck am I gonna build that house? Right? Like if you don't know what you're doing. But now imagine like I've been doing it professionally for 20 years right now. And so when you've been doing something that long, you know where to start. You know the yeah, process. You, and you know the trouble that you're going to run into. You know like where the issues are going to come. It becomes a lot. I'm not going to say easier. But listen, if you've climbed the mountain like 500 times, you know the mountain. You know like and you know like by the way, you could let's say, you know, like you could you could drop dead. It could be, you know, like bad conditions. You know, it's like, it's like, it might not be the best climb. It might not be the best script that we're working on. It might not be the best house, but like there is a process and the process is it just starts from an idea and it just builds on. It's like small steps, like building a house. You got to, yeah, you're building a product. You're like, building a, a legitimately. And it's like, you're talking about coloring in, you're talking about the furniture right now when you're talking about dialogue uh, and you're talking about, gotcha. Yeah. It's like, that's the design. You know what I mean? We're talking about like who's the character, what's their voice, what makes them interesting. Like these are like, it, it, it you know, it, it really starts from a place like you know, like Danny with gemstones. Like he, um, it was his idea, and he had this idea. I think it was in him for a really long time. He grew up kind of in that culture with these mega church pastors, and the and and that landscape was fascinating to him. And um, you know gemstones wasn't exactly always you know the first draft that he wrote you know it was like i don't i'm pretty sure I'm, he didn't have um a family i don't i think it was just him it was like he was married but like it wasn't about the three siblings and so um it evolves from kind of like it's an original concept you know it's like the like what what the uh and then it builds from there. You know, like Seinfeld. Seinfeld, like, they went in, like, there was no Elaine. They're like, we need a girl for the show. If you watch any of the, you know, how Seinfeld got made, you know, it's just an evolution. Or, like, like who's the fourth guy? Like, oh, let's have the neighbor Kramer. It's just let's just write him in there. All know? right, so let me, uh, so I want to, I don't want to miss out on some of the stuff I got to ask you. Yeah. All right? Um, and obviously, you take too long to go through your like we're going 1985 to 1986. I gotta I gotta speed up here, man. 19, I, well, 1985, I was in. High school. <laughs> yeah, we're, right. not, we're going backwards. We're going 1985. <laughs> I'm back on the couch in okay, Massachusetts. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so when okay we you had Oliver Stone, and then you make the decision that you're going to go into writing, and then the your your first big break is. Fairly Brothers. The Fairly Brothers. Yeah. With Unhitched? No, it was actually in uh, 2001, 2002. So, 2001. Um, and uh, that was an idea that um, I met with them a few times. And then... And are they, they're not that big at the time, right? Oh, they, they just dropped Mary. So now they're okay. like, boom, it's a game on. These guys are like... And it was kind of like pretty cool. I mean, it was, I mean like Pete's the mentor. Pete wrote... There's a book. If anyone is interested in, in writing... Or that, like you know, or a much better story or uh, storyteller than I am, like Pete Fairley. And by the way, the guy won an Oscar two years ago for Green Book. So it shows you a guy has oh, written. You know, I didn't know he wrote that. Yeah, I mean Bobby and Pete, but like they've done Dumb and Dumber, done something about Mary, and then Pete went off and just you know wrote, did an Oscar. But he's also a novelist. He wrote 
this hysterical book called The Comedy Writer. And I read that before I even met with him. And it was really about a guy coming out. It was like his story, but you know, but like not completely autobiographical, but like uh, based off of his experiences and you know his co- you know coloring it all in and making it funny. It's the funniest fucking book I ever read. But I identified with it. I'm like, that's me. And it's so crazy sometimes in life. Like now, like they're like he's just and he's a great person. He's a great mentor. I got lucky, but I also got to work with the dude. I mean, um, and we worked on a lot of projects. Like, uh, not only Unhitched, we, we've worked on telev- other television shows, other movies, like with Green Book. I read the first draft and, really? and gave him notes on that script. Um, and, uh, you know, Pete and Bobby are just, they're so lucky to kind of come into their circle. It's very similar, though. You know, it evolved into Sandler and into McBride. Who, and they're both you, good people. When you get good people, and it, you're really set, and if, if, if it connects, if it works out, there are always people like, you know, it, it, it becomes kind of like, this is my life right now, where it's like, I can't really fit too many people more, like, from a work standpoint, into that world. But, like, I would work with any of these people because they're just, they're good human beings, and they're so talented. Um and it, it, you know, to step in the room with Danny, he is so talented. He, uh, creatively, you have no idea how... And he's talking about Danny McBride. Yeah, how everybody. fast his brain works. It really is. Like, he has a Tarantino in him. Like, he is a writer, director. He was born with it. Like, and it is... And it's really cool working with somebody who is actually the actor in the show that you're writing. Who did you, who did you, who did you meet first, Sandler or McBride? Um... Ba, 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 ba. I think it was, you know, Kevin, my writing partner, he um, did Heartbreak Kid with um, with Danny, and he became friends with him. And then um, I met, it was probably around the same time. It was probably, but Sandler was more of a, like, work thing. More of like, he read your script, and he wants to do the do-over. And that was pretty cool. Um, and that was like, you know, one of those meetings where I didn't know Adam had read it, and he comes down from his office, and he's like, here's the deal. We're going to make this movie. <laughs> I have a couple notes, you know, and uh, I, is he is he funny in life or is he is it more of a serious? He c- is funny, but he's a good dude. Like we talk about Boston and like, you know, radio stations from Boston and like he grew up in New Hampshire. Uh, we're, you know, you have that little bit of a connection. You're like, all right, we kind of he grew up in a you know suburban town in, you know, New Hampshire and I was in Massachusetts. So um but like it was, you know, he's he's a workaholic. I mean, he's on you when he work, but he's just a good dude. Like he's a, you could tell, like he's a good father, he's a good husband, and he's a good boss. Like it's just, you know, and it's rare, right? You know, to and especially in Hollywood to have that, and, and it's really the same across the board. I've been lucky enough to deal with that with McBride and and Adam, and then the Fairleys, and they're yeah. All but th- I think that, that has people. something to do with with you. And who you associate with, you know, like uh, there's something about you that's causing I'm you a star fucker. <laughs> 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 uh, you, you're, you're, you, you must have some gift because you keep working. I like to fuck the stars. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, no, it's it's just fortunate, man. It's it's. Um, I know what you're saying, but and maybe there's some truth to it, but uh, you know that's the road, right? Right, like the, that's uh, like how I live my life and like how. Um, if it if it works out, I mean, I've worked for some assholes too. Yeah, know? like who? Who's you? Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's go down the list. Um, uh, but I've also like just worked for people that are just private and that just aren't, and that's cool. Like you don't have to like, like I don't need to meet your kids or your wife or get. You know, I don't need to drink beers with you or whatever. But um, and and it's like business, right? It's business. Some people you get along famously with. Um, that you have uh, a business relationship with, and some people you don't. Um, and all right, so I want to ask you this question. On to that, um, regarding that point you just made. <sighs> Damn it! I I cut and paste, but forgot to paste uh, the questions. But I remember the question. Okay. This is like a quick sidekick in case people. Uh, for Are we bringing up Ed Walsh again? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're done with Ed. Um, I think Ed Walsh too, isn't it? The um, Ed Walsh is uh, not the mistaking Ed Walsh from the missing 
Oh, um, person Ed Walsh. Yeah, it's a different Ed Walsh. No, no. I was I, when you said Ed, I actually expected you to say Ed Burns. I thought you were going to say Ed Burns uh, was. But this you guy. know, I'm I'm friends with. I know him pretty well too. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, his producing partner is one of my best friends. All right, he's and he, he started with me at Oliver Stone's company. Did he really? Yeah. Seems like a really good guy. Same year, same everything. Seems and, uh, like a Ed's a great dude, and his brother Brian, um, who's a writer on um, True with um, Blue Bloods. Oh yeah, yeah, he's got a great gig up in New York City. Yeah. Okay, so here's my question. This is just side thing in case we're losing anybody and they they're bored. You'll at least if you find this question interesting, then you probably um, will stay tuned. We're out to dinner, you and I. And the following celebrities walk in. They see you. I want to know if these people will come over and say hello to the table, <laughs> to you. Okay? John Goodman. No, he would not. Damn it. I'm not on set a lot. Okay. Very, I'm, I'm not on set a lot. All right. Sly Stallone. No. Have you met Sly? I have not met Sly Stallone. No. Okay. No. You're... I I've met a lot out there. Right, I mean, right. randomly, a lot of okay. random okay, meetings. Just, yeah, just stay with me here. Paula Patton. Yes, she will come to the table. She would. Yes. Yeah, I got to know her. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you have? A, why don't you get her on the Righteous Gemstones? Because she might be. Jen never listens to my show, so I'm not even <laughs> worried. Um, she might be one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, she is very beautiful. Very naturally. Beautiful. Like Kristen, do you know who Paula Patton is? I do not. She was married to... Um, you, Paula Patton or Paula Poundstone? Which one? <laughs> 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 no, Paula Patton. Paula Patton was married to... Um, what's the... Alan Thicke's son. Yeah. Robin Thicke. Robin Thicke. Thick. Yeah. Oh, and, he's, and, he's good looking. Well, he, I think he... They have a kid together. Uh, yeah, I think they he have a abused boy. her we, and stuff. We talked about that. She was divorced when she was doing our movie. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think you need to get her on the righteous gemstones, and then you and I are going to have dinner every night <laughs> until we run into her. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm not done yet. Um, Adam Sandler. Yes, definitely. I would be yes. Definitely. Like you'd be pissed if he didn't come over and say hello. He saw you. There's he no at question. You. Yes, okay. we're 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 good friends. David Spade, hundred um, percent. Julia Roberts. No. Eric Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> negative. All right, no further questions on that. All right, so... Oliver Stone, negative. <laughs> <laughs> He'd look at me and I'd run. <laughs> um, what, what, what person that's super famous, I'm not saying, but would come over? You know, it, these, these things, though, with stars, like, I don't know, like, one of the things... If I were to give any advice and you know to people and like, it's just not that big a deal. Like you know, I, I'm more concerned about like, you know, how my son's gonna pitch tonight than I am about, you know, meeting or, you know, some of these stars or hanging out with them or doing whatever. But it's do like, you do you realize that now that you and I we know each other and stuff? <laughs> That I realize I have to call Paula Patton and get her out here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've <laughs> or spent maybe that's not a good move. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's totally fine. I just I just want to meet her. Um, honey, I love you more than... I'm not even worried. <laughs> Jen's not even going to listen to this, so it doesn't matter. All right, so, okay. Um, w but who are other stars? Who, who's one other star? I'm just curious that would that I'm not saying that you your you're, you're buddy's with and that would come over to the table... That I'm not mentioning, maybe. Well, uh, you know, um, it, it's somebody who I've just gotten friendly with over Zoom is Vince Vaughn, and he's mm. a like really he's my age, and he has kids, and um, we're talking about doing a project together, and we spend a ton of time on Zoom. So I don't know if he would recognize me, but I'm gonna go to LA in um, a couple of weeks, and uh, we're gonna uh, uh, meet in person. Uh, but uh, so, like, where will we all meet? Like, are you going to meet, like, at a coffee shop? And he, um, I don't know yet. And maybe we won't meet. Maybe he doesn't <laughs> want to meet me in person. But, no, but the creatively, um, Kevin and I really gelled with him. And uh, we're trying to get him to, like, work with... Uh, and he wants to work with McBride and 
Uh, oh, that know. would be a great combo. Yeah, man. exactly. That's what you try to do. You know, we're we're here in Charleston. Uh, you know, hopefully for a really long time, and uh, and you try to build something, and and that's what Danny's done. I mean, Danny's the the pioneer of it. Him and David Gordon Green have kind of brought this kind of Hollywood, um, you know foothold into Charleston and uh, starting to build it. We need more tax credits and then we can bring more production here. Um, but also like, it's you need kind me of, talk, you need me to talk to McMaster for you. Yeah. I mean, we need all the help. I mean, uh, they're into it. Like Brandon, uh, James who runs Danny's company. Uh, I know he's always 24 seven. He's on top of it. He knows all those dudes. Um, the get, political get, guys, uh, we have to do that because there could be like, you know, like we're shooting out of the Citadel Mall. That's our studio, you know. Um, I'll get McMaster. But like, uh, if, well, if we get him on the phone, Kristen. I'll, I'll tell get you McMaster what. McMaster on the phone. If we got the tax credits up, it would be a race to build a studio here. I mean, there's been, I can't tell you how many people even approached. Like I've heard about it, where it's like, hey, you know, we're thinking about building a studio, but if you don't have, if you have a limitation of what you could shoot here. Then well, does it make sense? You know what I mean. You like, but if you got, if you if you if you built up a just common sense, if you could shoot more stuff here, um, more jobs, and um, obviously the you need bigger studios. You know, oh, I'll, I'll, this is done. I, I, I got it done. I, I got political connections here. I mean, I, I, like I said, I thought we had Chris Pappas, the congressman, on today. Now you, you do. <laughs> All right, I got to go through some quick questions because we. You, you, the tape is gone way beyond, and, and I have so much more. Okay. But but we got another show going on. Uh, the next show is nothing uh, going to be as exciting as yours. <laughs> so um, I they can't hear me because we <laughs> they're outside right now. They can't hear me. I won't tell you who that person is, so that way you guys don't you, make sure you still listen to the next show. Um, do you feel? And I'm going to just run through quick questions. I want you sure. to try to be fast on this. Do you feel you have hit your point for success? Like, do you feel like you're there now, or is there still something you're driving? There's a growth. I mean, the directing side. That That's could be the growth. That, but you know what? Listen, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I'm pretty happy. I got a great family. I got a good job. I like what I do. Um, and I'm having fun. And if it, if it goes another notch up or whatever, that's great. As long as I can maintain... If I can maintain the life I'm living now, yeah, let me tell you guys, then I'm good. Yeah, this guy lives on the beach on <laughs> Sullivan's Island. Other celebrities live on Sullivan's Island. Uh, I can't afford to live in Sullivan's Island, um, so it's it's. Uh, well, but depending on the ratings of this show, we could I could end up moving there. Um, all right, what? piece of work have you done that you go that's the f my favorite piece of work i've ever done if you had to um, pick one there's one uh, the first script that kevin and i wrote um that never got made but everyone loved it and it was about um uh it's called produced by and it, you know it's just so it's just a 30 page script but it's about kind of a twisted movie producer you know who's just it's like the diabolical nature of a of a film producer um, it's like perfect for somebody like William Macy. My favorite, hands down, uh, thing that we've uh, really? we've written. And a lot of people like you know, it's funny. Before the whole Harvey Weinstein, it, like it got through all his company, and it got to Harvey, and Harvey read it, and he's like, "It's too much like me. <laughs> <laughs> They'll think it's me." <laughs> and then everyone like after that, it was always get to like the top of the food chain, and they'll be like, "I can't do it. They'll think it's me." And uh, and so that is that just is uh, that's sitting there right now. But that that, that would be my favorite piece. Um, what keeps you up at night today? Anything? You you seem like you just got it all made. Well, I sleep well. Yeah. Yeah. Probably like you know what keeps me up at night. Um, Are you still vegan, by the way? Am I still drinking? No, vegan. No, that was just like a month. I told you you couldn't. I couldn't it, do yeah. it. It's good though. You felt uh, good February though. was like half vegan, and then it's like not at all now. Yeah. But you know what happened is, um, the vegan place that I was getting food from, uh, was it Basic Kitchen? Yeah, they just stopped doing the delivery shit. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you just screwed me. You just put twenty pounds <laughs> back on me. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, it, it it it's a different life. But okay, 
enough about that. Um, in five years, are you still living on Sullivan's? And what does your life look like if you had to go uh, with the pearly gates? Yes, I think I, I am hopefully still living on Sullivan's. Uh, yeah. And what do you, what, what part time? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and what do you do? What what is is there? Are you directing a movie at that time? I think uh, I'm pretty confident in the next five years we'll, we'll be directing uh, television and and and, and movies. Can Maybe. I? Maybe, but I'm also happy. Like I'm like to tell you the truth, I love what I'm doing right now. Like working on the show with Gemstones and writing like half the year with with Danny and the company and and Edie and and Kevin and and John. And, and Jeff, um, it's so much fun, and I get so much out of it. Uh, it burns you out hard, but it's like just to able to step away from it, and then they shoot it, and I'm able to do this all this other stuff um, with Kevin, and uh, it's kind of a good balance. It's almost kind of like we're driving the bus for six months of the year, and then I hop on this Danny bus, and the Danny bus is fun. and uh, That's so good. And man. it's different. You know, it's kind of like sometimes – the, the shit can get monotonous. You know what I mean? So if you're doing the same thing with the same dude, like over and over and over again, and then so to change the stuff up like this, um, it's fun. You're like, it's kind of like, it's a relief in a weird way. It's a lot more work in a, in a lot of ways. Um, it was, it, he's a bit of a slave driver, but it's, uh, but it's great stuff. And I'm like, I'm always in awe of him too. Like it's, it's, um, it's like it's challenging. It's it keeps you sharp, um, and but you don't have to drive the bus. You know what I mean? Like I've been driving the bus a long time, you know, and uh, it is fun to jump on somebody's bus and 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 cruise for a little while, but also work maybe twice as hard. You know, it's just like I don't know. Like that's been a, that's actually been the coolest thing about coming here is. It's like when things go into balance. And I feel like things are in balance right now. I got to tell you, I've had, I don't know, we've done 17, 18 shows. I don't know how many. And I've had some super, super successful people on the on on here. Way more successful than you. <laughs> and I am not that <laughs> successful. And um, from from guys that have tremendous wealth to people who are just very... Uh, successful in their occupation, whether that's fina financial, w w they're just successful, okay? And they're all great people. I got, n and and I include myself into this whole mix. I think you are by far the truest, happiest <laughs> guest that is successful that we've had on the show. Like, I can just. You're just genuinely I happy. ooze with balance. Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. Like the rest of us, including me, you know, um, we're a freaking wreck, you know? <laughs> and you're like in in la la. You're I just don't, you know what? And listen, I appreciate that. But, you know, life is, uh, listen, every day, it's not like I just wake up and get stoned and just hang out and do my job. You know, I'm driving kids to school, but I love that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, no, it, you're. And listen, this gentleman is a big time father. Um, I don't know if he's a good husband or not, but he's a <laughs> big time father. He, he, you are. You're always there. You're. And you, and to me, it, that that says a lot be, because it's hard. It to it's hard to balance being truly successful. And 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 Chris Pappas is truly. He really is successful. I mean, I'm making fun, but the guy is. The guy's a big hit, but you do seem to be able to balance because um, a lot of times you just can't do both. You can't. You can't be super good. Uh, it's very hard to be very good professionally, as well as be very good personally. You, usually, one's getting hurt over the other. Yeah. So um, I appreciate that. You know, um, it was well, tough. It was tough and back and forth. You know, the first year I was on doing gemstones in the writers' room, I wasn't li like the family was out west. And that was really hard. And I had to like fly back and forth and I'm missing, you know, my son's basketball or baseball games and I'm just like not there or when I can be there. And then I was hanging out on Sullivan's one day by myself. Just I just went for a swim the one day I had off. And I'm like, saw all the families there and I called my wife and I'm like, We're moving to Sullivan's <laughs> Island. I saw the future. <laughs> 
And she was cool? Yes. I saw the parallel universe of the well, Pappas he, well, family. But your wife is a successful career woman. She is, yep. No, you we're... Um, that's the stress right there. By the way, that's a whole other episode is like raising kids with like your wife is just as busy as you are. And uh, that is, yeah, that's. Do a, you have like, that's a do you, do y'all have like $100 bills thrown into your tub like rose petals? Like, we just have, have 30 so people money. working for us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I got to, I got to keep going here. All right. Yep. Here's a question I'm very interested in. If you were tasked to start a movie, uh, studio like a Paramount Pictures type of company. Okay, mm-hmm. you were tasked to do that, and you had to hire celebrities that you've worked with, whether that's actors, directors, writers, whatever. Okay, who would your executive team be? So first, who would be your CEO of that company? Paula Patton. <laughs> <laughs> can I? Can I? Can I be Paula's secretary? So, yeah. <laughs> Paula I know I would get you as an investor. <laughs> I'd be like, it's run by Paula Patton, Eric. Are you in? <laughs> the sad thing is that now someone is listening to this going, did you know, Jen, did you know that your husband's in love with Paula Patton? And she's going like, I don't even know. He's never even said anything about it. I know. I've kept it a secret all this time. Um, okay, CEO. So the CEO of C- a, like a famous person, a f- a, someone that you've been you've been around, you've worked with, or whatever, but you know that's in the in your your business. Who? But you're now starting up a, a Paramount hmm. Pictures. Who would you you have to pick the executive team? Who is the CEO of the company? I guess like um, so, like the face of the franchise, so to speak. The person that's going to not make make this company another level. Where who who is a celebrity? Who, yes, who is the person? So like, is it is this person oh like my God. have I mean, a great is... work <laughs> ethic? I mean, I don't know. Like, I mean, I guess like I'd have to say, you know, uh, you know, I, I would. I mean, M- McBride is the guy who just wears all the hats. Okay, so McBride, your CEO. I mean, M- McBride would be my CEO because like he just he can act, he can write, he can produce, he can direct, he can do everything. He okay. can edit. He can it's like then, you know. Then CEO is is Danny McBride. It is LLC. <laughs> Who is your CFO, Chief Financial Officer? Uh, we'll go with Sandler because right. he has more money than anybody. Okay. <laughs> and who is Vice President of Sales? Um, we'll go with Pete Fairley on that. Peter mm-hmm. Fairley. He's a pretty good salesman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you heard that question. He's no. got a little Willie Loman in I him. promise you, <laughs> if you, it, whatever shows you go on, this question will never be asked. That question that I just asked you. No one will ever ask that. Yeah. That that's an original right. copyright question by me. All right. Which writer do you admire the most and think of them as like the Michael Jordan of writing? Hmm. That's a tough one. I mean, it's again not to not to repeat it, but um, you know, uh, you know, I'm gonna say my writing partner, Kevin Barnett. Jeez, I'm pretty. Imp- Kevin's got the most incredible work ethic. He's tenacious. It's um, it's just such a pleasure to work. That's a whole other conversation. Why too. didn't you get Kevin Barnett on the show, uh, Kristen? Totally you know what? That's a good sequel to the show. Then you get his whole thing. Um, but uh, yeah, he's uh, uh, you know, I'm. A, it's a privilege to work with somebody and uh, and, and you get to share. You know, and like you part do, of this and is you we truly, share everything. You know and you I mean? truly. He's my have work a, wife. You, know? you truly have a good time having being around him because having partners is very hard. It's very hard. No, it's it's like everything's on the table. We always joke around that like if like it was like who could plan a better night for you, your wife or me? <laughs> and it's like not even close. <laughs> <laughs> your wife. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what you say, but we all know that's not the case. Yeah. Um, all right. When you meet these successful executives, um, directors, actors, producers, just the world that you live in. I'm just curious, what, what, what traits, um, what puts them, which, what's something about the Adam Sandlers, the Danny McBrides? What, is there something that you look at and go, God, they all just seem to have that. A a, a real passion and an incredible work ethic, like a ridiculous work worth. I mean, their work ethic is, is, and I, you know, Danny and Adam, and they just don't stop. 
You know what I mean? Um, Adam is, is, is on another level. Adam is just like, you'd think a guy would like, he's done it all and would just take a break. And it's like how he juggles what he juggles, like with his family and movie to movie. And I'm going to shoot this movie and produce this movie. And like, you look at his body of work, he's done everything. He's had successful TV shows. He's had successful um, animated movies with the, the Transylvania franchise. You look at um, the uh, movies that he's produced. You looked at, uh, the acting, and then he steps away, and he does uncut gems. He does like, great movie, you know, all these other things, and like his body of work. I mean, it's really unprecedented when you look at it compared. Like we're talking, how many decades has he been doing it for? Pretty, and you know, it doesn't happen without him just driving the train. You know what I mean? Like he is just doesn't slow down. Is he going to move to Charleston? You think, Sullivan? You know what? I, I'm a I'm, yeah. He lo- he's a big fishing guy, so I'm trying to like he likes to. It, it, it'll happen. We're going to get him out. I keep texting him about coming him, and he's in. He, but you have to, like, the only way he can travel, though, because he works so much, is to set a movie here that he can be in, and then you get him here. Because I'm, I'm he work. doesn't vacation. I'm going to work on the whole, um, the extra credits uh, for, for I, I can help you guys there. Um, so... I just want to be like... That's a, a big deal. I want to be a character on The Righteous Gemstones. Can, if I can get the extra <laughs> credits, can y'all make me... I can see you as like a, a some a preacher. I can see you out there. I want to be the Fred Thompson. Remember Fred Thompson? He was the um, U.S. Senator for Tennessee, but then he would I can act. see a politician. You're right. But I'm saying I want to be that guy where I'm, I'm this the insurance financial guy 75% of the time which is what I do, and I like doing what I do. But 25% of the time, I'm just going to go shoot a movie and be a side character. I don't want to be the main guy. I just want to be a side character. Side character. Okay. Like, for, like Fred Thompson. He's passed away now, but um, he was like in a bunch of movies. Back the in character the actor. Yeah, I just want to be Same. side. Okay. Hey, you, it's never too late. My old neighbor um, got her first acting gig at 91 in Santa Monica, and she went on to be in from 91 to like she was 100. She was in like a bunch of Ain't It Sunny in Philadelphia. She had a recurring role. Really? She was in like national commercials. She we put her in Heartbreak Kid. Um, and uh, were you were you part of Heartbreak Kid too? Kevin did that. And I was working with the Fairleys, you know. So I wasn't like I really didn't do any work on it, but I was just around for it, you know. By the way, I w- when I was doing all the research on this interview, I did tons of research. One of the things that no one knows, I, I obviously dug deep, is Kevin was the writer on the movie Hall Pass. Correct. Yep. Not Hall Pass. Is it Hall, Hall? Pass? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that the one where... Jason Sudeikis. Owen yeah. Wilson, yeah. Okay. So I'm playing golf last week, and a buddy of mine goes, you, you, remember, you remember in Hall Pass? And I go, I, I haven't seen Hall Pass. He goes, you haven't seen Hall Pass? Dude. <laughs> That is the fun, and he starts playing out the scene for me of them. So I guess the guys go to Applebee's and they're planning on having a big right. night, and then then they're too stuffed to to go out. Right, right. And he goes, "Man, you, you gotta you gotta see this movie." So I I'm dying. I gotta see it because he started telling me. So just don't watch it with your wife. <laughs> no, I, I I won't because <laughs> then and especially after this episode airs. With you yes, because she'll be like, all you're thinking right. about is Paula Patton. You're, you're trying to trying to get Paula Patton as the hall pass. That's what's trying to happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> late, uh, Chris, you said it all. But before we end this phenomenal interview, and I've had a great time talking to you, brother. Um, I'm so not That's looking fun. forward to the next the, the next show I got to do. Um, but they can't hear me out there, so it's <laughs> fine. What what are you working on right now outside of the gemstones? What are you working on? What can we promote for people to be on the where you know be on the lookout for the near future? What's coming? What's coming from Chris Pappas and Kevin Barnett? Um, we're doing we're in the animated space uh, doing a um, movie with Danny that he I believe he is uh, directing and producing, but it's with this um, the people who like really were part of all those Pixar movies as a big um, animation uh, studio called Spire Animation that just like formed last year and were one of the first projects. It's a movie called Trouble. And so it's a family, you know, Pixar level 
type movie, and we just finished the uh, first draft of that. Oh, that's cool. And it's really, we're pretty happy with it, and I think um, it's a long process, so you probably won't, you know, see this in for at least, you know, another 18 months, because the animated world is, um, is a, uh, it just takes a long time. Yeah, it's, it's a long process, but it's a really cool process because as you're writing, you know, you, you have these like meetings and you see these drawings and sketches and you see the world that you're actually writing these, this crazy animated world with these super talented artists, uh, taking your kind of vision and, uh, and making it even cooler. And that's been like, uh, we've never done that before. And, um, we've been doing that a lot. Like we just finished the first draft. So we're just like, you know, the house building thing is kind of like, Oh my God. All right. Like the, the heavy lifting part of it. And now it gets like fun where you can start like making it better and, you know, honing it and spending the next few months, uh, several months doing that. So, so trouble is coming. Trouble is coming. And, uh, gemstones season two, um, I believe the word on the street, I think it's January, but, um, and then, uh, and then there's. Uh, I'm trying to think of. Uh, there's, you know, there's a couple other things um, that uh, that are in the in the works and that we're working on. But I don't want to. Nothing like coming out next fall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we we have had the opportunity to enjoy this. How long has this interview been? Uh, an hour and forty. Oh my God, Woo. that's an all time record. It's just like a movie. <laughs> um. <laughs> With Chris Pappas, a famous writer, director, will be even a bigger director. You guys wait. You hear, he said it here. Five years from now, he's going to be directing the Ed Walsh story. <laughs> and, um, the Ed Walsh documentary. <laughs> is, where is Ed? And I st- Is Ed dead? And I That's star as Ed Walsh. <laughs> Uh, so guys th- poor Ed I uh, love Ed he's a good guy hopefully he's, he's, oh, he's I'm, doing well I'm tagging Ed on all the publis- publicity I'll find this guy the problem is when you search for Ed Walsh it's you know the other one takes over yeah but still I'll find this guy um, that is Ed Walsh right the, I, yeah I'm yeah. pretty positive my roommate used to watch that show yeah uh, alright I had a great <laughs> time brother Great time. Thank I really you appreciate you no, being on. No, this has been fun. And I look yeah. forward to a lot of drinks uh, on Sullivan's. Uh, and some vegan. I'll get back to s- vegan. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I want to do that. Guys, uh, you have been listening to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast, uh, sitting here with Chris Pappas, writer, famous, friends with everyone. but the Star c- fucker. But... <laughs> Sly Stallone won't come over to the table, so I don't know. Maybe Frank Stallone would come to the table, but not Sly. Um, Larry Stallone was a good friend of mine. <laughs> he would come over to the table. Good old Lawrence. If you good listen guy. to, if you want to listen to any of the other shows or watch uh, some of the video portions of our show, please take advantage of YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, all the apps out there. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn. I am the host, Eric Elkins, owner. Um, of Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions, and we are in the Double E Studios with Chris Pappas today, and we had a great time. You can also listen or go to our website, www.shrimptankpodcast.com slash Charleston to see other episodes. Um, but uh, great show, Chris. Uh, world record, hour and 45 minutes. Um, I hope everyone is tuned in and, and listen to this because this is one hell of a show you gave us today. I can't thank you enough, man. Hey, thanks for having me, and uh, all good, man. Thank you. Keep at it. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp.